The Scharnhorst was an interwar German battleship laid down in 1934, commissioned in 1939, and sank at sea in 1943. The story behind this ship is more than just a feat of engineering, but instead a product of technological and political events that took place during the mid-20th century. There are many common questions about the Scharnhorst. Was it a battlecruiser? Was it a good design? And probably most commonly asked, why was she designed with 11-inch guns, some 20 years after the end of World War I? During this video I'm going to answer these questions, as well as give an overview of the ship's design and operational history. The pinnacle of German ship design during World War I was arguably the Bayern class of super dreadnoughts. They had 13.8 inches of belt armour, giving them thicker belts than the Queen Elizabeth class of British battleship. They also mounted 15 inch guns, 8 barrels in 4 turrets, just like the Queen Elizabeth's. Granted, they could only hit a top speed of 21 knots, compared to the British ship's 24 knots. But you get what I'm trying to say. Germany wasn't a million miles behind the British when it came to naval technology. As a matter of fact, the German Navy was the second most powerful fleet in the world in 1914, and could easily face off against any other nation, with the exception of the British. So what went wrong when it came to interwar ship design and the Second World War German Navy? Put simply, the Treaty of Versailles. This limited the German Navy to six old pre-dreadnought battleships and a selection of light cruisers. Each of the six battleships could only be replaced once each individual ship became 20 years old. The caveat was that any replacements for these ships could be no larger than 10,000 tons in displacement and could not carry any weapons larger than 11 inches in calibre. The first chance for the Germans to launch a new ship was in 1922 when the old pre-dreadnought Preussen turned 20. These new ships turned out to be the Deutschen class of heavy cruiser, commonly known as pocket battleships to the British. Due to the 10,000 ton limit put on Germany, the Deutschlands had some serious compromises in their design, notably in the armour and firepower. With an armoured belt of 3.1 inches, the class was incredibly vulnerable to enemy fire, even from light cruisers. The armament was also fairly lacklustre, having two turrets, one forward and one aft, each housing three 11-inch guns, for a total of six barrels. The Germans building these ships, however, prompted the French to start building the Dunkirk class of battleships in 1932. A year later in 1933, a certain Austrian man that shall not be named came to power in Germany. His main rival, at least in his own head, were the French. And the existence of the Dunkirks prompted the Germans to start building the Scharnhorst class of battleships. Yes, battleships, not battlecruisers. In 1935, the angry Austrian entered talks with the British, which resulted in the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, which guaranteed Britain a 3 to 1 superiority in capital ships, but more importantly, removed the limitations of the Treaty of Versailles for the German Navy, allowing them to exceed the 10,000 tonne limit, with the new limit being a maximum of 35,000 tonnes, and allowing the Germans to theoretically place 16-inch guns on their ships. This is where the unseen effects of World War I became apparent. Due to Germany losing most of its experienced designers in the interwar period, due to cuts, retiring, and a general loss of production, due to the French occupation of the industrious Leinrand, the resulting German armour, firepower, radar and propulsion designs lag significantly behind the leading naval powers, namely the UK, US and the Japanese. As originally designed, the Scharnhorst class were 235 metres long, displaced 35,500 tonnes, they had a draft of 9.1 metres and had 21 watertight compartments as well as a double bottom, protecting around 80% of the hull length. This increased underwater protection, as well as compartment separation, was one of the major differences between pre-war and post-war ship designs. The days of a single torpedo sinking a whole battleship due to progressive flooding was theoretically long gone. Initially, the Germans were going to use a form of diesel engine in the Scharnhorsts. They had used a similar type of engine in the earlier Deutschen class, but when German designers looked at the role the Scharnhorst class was to fulfil, it was noted that the Scharnhorst would need around three times as much power as the older battleship design. Diesel engines at the time just couldn't produce this amount of power, and therefore, traditional high-pressure steam turbines were chosen to power the ships. Both of the two ships making up the Scharnhorst class had three geared turbines, driving three screws. But the Scharnhorst and Neisenau used different brands of turbines, with the Scharnhorst using brown turbines, and the knives are now using Germania turbines. The Scharnhorst engines were powerful, producing 157,811 shaft horsepower, allowing the ships to reach a flank speed of just over 31 knots. This speed and power was very impressive. For comparison, 
the British King George V battleship only produced 111,000 shaft horsepower, with a flank speed of 28 knots. While both of these ships were designed for slightly different roles, it was still a strikingly high top speed for a fully armoured ship of the time. We now go to one of the negatives of her design, the armour layout. While German steel was just as good as British steel, the layout of the Scharnhorst armour scheme was seriously inefficient. Despite the rest of the world, with the exception of the Italians, adopting all or nothing armour schemes, the Germans, again, due to their lack of experienced ship designers, used the same varied armour schemes commonly found in World War I battleships. The same issue was also found in the later Bismarck class of battleship. All or nothing armour designs concentrate vital components of the ship and encase them in thick slab armour, commonly referred to as a ship's citadel. The rest of the ship received very little armour, hence the name All or Nothing. The Scharnhorst, on the other hand, had a lot of armour at variable thicknesses. While both designs can provide adequate protection, the All or Nothing design is much more efficient, allowing for more armour to be added for a similar displacement. In practice, this allowed Allied ships to be better protected while simultaneously having a low percentage of their displacement being used for armour. For example, the King George V class of British battleships had 14.7 inches of belt armour and carried more as well as significantly larger guns, always having just a slightly higher displacement of 37,000 tonnes. The Scharnhorst had a main armour belt of 13.7 inches in thickness and as mentioned above, had a displacement of 35,500 tonnes. While varied armour schemes protected more parts of the ship, in the age of big guns, you couldn't realistically armour the whole ship against capital grade weaponry. Therefore, it was thought best to scrap the weaker armour usually found surrounding the bow and stern area of the ship and use that saved displacement to increase the main bell and deck protection. While the Scharnhorst armour scheme was outdated by World War II, it certainly cannot be said that the ship was under armoured, it was just inefficiently armoured. Rather ironically for the product of German engineering, Quite a lot of the Scharnhorst design was seriously inefficient, and in my opinion, the best example of this is the secondary and anti-aircraft batteries. But first, let's talk about the Allies. The British and Americans had developed dual-purpose secondary batteries, allowing one turret and one gun design to effectively engage both naval and air targets. The Americans had the wonderful 5-inch 38 gun, and the British had the 4.5-inch and 5.25-inch guns. This was another major issue between the Allies and the Germans. The Germans used different guns for different roles, instead of combining them all into one weapon system. Battleships are obviously space limited, so trying to fit several different weapon systems onto a ship, making sure you have enough of them to be effective, and making sure they're mounted in a location that gives you a good field of fire, as well as making sure they don't impede the field of fire of other weapons. As I said, this wasn't an issue for Allied designers, as they had 4.5, 5 and 5.25 inch guns mounted in dedicated turrets, and then smaller 20 and 40mm guns positioned higher up in the ship. This gave all weapon systems a good field of fire, as well as protected each gun crew from the blast effects of each gun. While the Scharnhorst did suffer particularly badly from this inefficiency of weaponry, it was also found on pretty much all of Germany's capital ships, and most of their light and heavy cruisers. Again. This results from a lack of experienced designers, carried over from World War I. But let's go into depth on the Scharnhorst weaponry. Firstly, it had 12 15cm naval guns for its anti-surface secondary battery, with 8 of those barrels being mounted in twin turrets, and the remaining 4 guns being mounted in single turrets. These 6-inch guns were very powerful in its dedicated anti-surface role, but they were too slow firing and too slow tracking to engage aircraft effectively. While I think 6-inch guns are a little bit outdated for World War II, you can kind of see why the Germans fought to carry them. Whereas British and American ships usually sailed with a fleet of light, heavy, and a flotilla of destroyers wherever they went, German ships cannot be said to do this, as throughout the entire war, Germany did have a strong lacking of destroyers. And considering the Konigsberg class of light cruisers could barely sail out of port without capsizing, they practically had no light cruisers either. This meant German capital ships effectively were by themselves when they went out to sea, meaning they'd have to defend themselves from enemy capital ships, enemy light, heavy and destroyers, as well as enemy aircraft. So while you can criticise the Scharnhorst for these 6 inch guns, it is more of a criticism of the German naval strategy. But anyway, the Germans did understand that the 6 inch guns weren't very effective in their dedicated anti-air role, as the Scharnhorst class also carried 14 105mm guns, or 10.5cm. Again, no issues with effectiveness here, 
The guns were very capable, but if the Germans had a dual purpose design, they could have more guns with better firing arcs which could engage all targets the ship encountered, be that CRO. Instead, the 15cm and 10.5cm guns competed for space and displacement. The ship also carried an array of 3.7cm and 2cm flat guns, the German equivalent of the Bofors and Orlikon. That covers the important things about the secondary and anti-aircraft batteries, and now onto the main battery, the 11 inch or technically 28cm SKC-34 naval guns. These were similar to the 28cm guns found on the Deutschland class of heavy cruisers covered earlier, but they had slightly longer barrels. This gave the projectiles slightly more muzzle velocity and a little bit more power, but we'll get to that later. As frequently pointed out, these are a rather small calibre of gun for a battleship. Most navies didn't even use 11 inch guns in World War 1, never mind the mid 1930s. But size isn't everything, as all those fellas know. There were in fact some positives. The loading systems were very fast, at least compared to other similar sized weapons. The guns could fire every 17 seconds, which is impressive, but rate of fire isn't actually that useful in combat, especially considering these ships were designed before the introduction of accurate fire control systems, which meant the ship would usually fire, observe the fall of shot, and then plot the corrections before firing again, something which cannot be done if you are continuously firing the guns. This somewhat nullified the practical rate of fire advantage the Scharnhorst had. But why use 11 inch guns? We already know that the Germans were allowed to produce 16 inch guns, agreed with the British in the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. So again, why 11 inch guns? Basically, the Germans didn't know how to make large guns in the early 1930s. The largest guns the Germans had produced up until this point were the 15 inch 45 caliber gun produced in 1913 for the Bayern class of battleship. So why not simply just use these guns, or similar guns on the Scharnhorst class? Well to start us off, the Germans did want larger guns, 15 inch guns to be exact, but again, due to losing the professional gun designers, a larger naval gun could not simply be designed. It would take years of development in order to produce these larger guns, and as we all unfortunately found out, the Austrian man in charge of Germany was not in favour of waiting around. So why not just bring out the plans for the old 15 inch 45 gun and plonk them on the Scharnhorst? Well, times had changed. Guns designed prior to World War I could no longer reliably punch through the contemporary battleship armour at modern combat ranges of 20,000 yards and upwards. The German Navy wanted modern, high velocity weapons, and the gun that would be eventually produced from this was the 38cm L52 gun, a gun widely considered to have an extremely high muzzle velocity, which certainly was powerful enough to penetrate the armour of contemporary warships, as HMS Hood unfortunately found out. While these larger 15 inch guns were impressive when they were finally designed, in the early 1930s they were still several years away from being produced, and due to the German government wanting battleships in the water ASAP, it was thought better to give these ships 9 11 inch guns rather than delaying the ships for several years, and waiting until the larger guns had been fully developed. However, knowing larger guns were in the pipeline, the turret rings were designed to house both 11 inch and 15 inch gun turrets. The plan was to retrofit these ships after 15 inch guns had been produced. This would have transformed the Scharnhorst from battleships armed with 9 11 inch guns into a ship carrying 6 15 inch guns, giving them similar firepower to the British Renan and Repulse battle cruisers. Although in the end, none of the Scharnhorst class received these weapons. The Neisenau was bombed in port and then ordered to be sunk as a block ship, and as we are soon about to find out, the Scharnhorst was never able to make it back to Germany to receive this refit. We have now covered all of the basic statistics for the class, let's now cover the history. The Scharnhorst was commissioned in January 1939 and swiftly entered sea trials. These trials showed a major weakness in the design. It was the same issue that had plagued a number of British ships. The older British battleship designs tended to have a much lower focusal, basically a lower bow at the front of the ship. In the Royal Navy, this allowed the two front turrets to fire directly forwards at close range targets. While this did benefit the gunnery of a ship, it seriously compromised the handling in rough seas, as the bow wave, as well as other regular waves, could wash up onto the deck of the ships. This vast amount of water being thrown onto the front of the ship both damaged vital components, mainly the forward turret, as well as pushed down on the ship, causing more drag, slowing the ship down. This wasn't a major issue for the British, as their battleships were designed to sail landing fleets and fight in a battle line. The same was not true for the Scharnhorsts. 
the Germans just didn't have the ships for a battle line, and German naval strategy had a large emphasis on surface raiding. And considering the Scharnhorst were mainly going to be operating in the Atlantic and North Seas, a vessel with poor sea keeping just wasn't acceptable. Because of this, the ship went into refit and added a so-called Atlantic bow. This was longer than the original and also flowed at the top, which deflected waves away from the ship like an upside down snowplow. After this refit, the Scharnhorst went on her first deployment. She finished her refit in August of 1939 and by November was sortying in the North Sea between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. She was joined by her sister Nisenau as well as two Konigsberg light cruisers. They engaged and sank the British merchant cruiser Rabel Pindi. This was a civilian merchant ship that had been acquired by the Admiralty and fitted with a few 6 inch guns. The Rabel Pindi could only reach a top speed of 15 knots and was no match for the 31 knots of the Scharnhorst. A year later in April 1940, during the German invasion of Norway and Denmark, Scharnhorst, again with her sister ship, picked up a contact on their radar systems and moved in for an attack. Shortly afterwards, the two ships encountered HMS Renown, the old British battle cruiser. Nisano hit the British ship but received three hits in return, one from a 15 inch gun and two others from the 4.5 inch multi-purpose guns. One of the latter hits disabled the Nisenau's Anton turret and the 15 inch shell knocked out the main fire control system. The Scharnhorst also suffered a gunnery radar malfunction, leaving the ship unable to accurately engage the Renown. Because of the damage to both ships, as well as the British destroyer screen closing in, the German ships were forced to withdraw. During the withdrawal, the addition of the Atlantic bow proved to be subpar, as in the high speed exit of the combat zone, water rushed onto the bow of Scharnhorst, damaging the Anton turret. Both Scharnhorst and Nisenau then headed to Wilhelmshaven for repairs. Two months later, during the latter days of the Norway campaign, both ships of the Scharnhorst class sailed again. They encountered the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and the two destroyers escorting her. All three ships were sunk, with Scharnhorst claiming the kill on Glorious. However, before one of the British destroyers slipped below the waves, it fired four torpedoes at the German task force, three of which were dodged, but the fourth torpedo hit the ship on the starboard side, near the Caesar turret or rear turret. This caused significant damage to the Scharnhorst, giving her a list of three degrees, and the flooding of the starboard engine rooms caused her to be down three meters by the stern. Both Scharnhorst and Nisenau once again withdrew, dodging retaliatory British bombing attempts. The Admiralty wanted vengeance for the sinking of the Glorious, but several waves of British bombers would prove unsuccessful. Both ships had to stay in dock for nearly six months while undergoing repair, the next sortie was in January of 1941, when both ships of the class broke out into the Atlantic. The purpose of their mission was convoy raiding, hunting down the vital supply ships, fueling the British war effort. They succeeded in locating a convoy, but the cargo vessels were being escorted by HMS Ramillies, an old R-class battleship, armed with eight 15-inch guns. The two ships chose to disengage, rather than risk fighting the old British ship. While both Scharnhorst and Nisenau stood a good chance of beating the Ramillies, their convoy raiding mission meant that unnecessary risk should be avoided. Even slight damage to either ship would mean both would be forced back to port, as you cannot carry out a commerce raiding mission with half a functioning ship, especially with the British battlecruisers on patrol. A month later, another convoy was spotted, but again, it had a battleship escort, and the two ships broke off and headed to the occupied French port of Brest. This is where the British finally got some revenge for the loss of Glorious. While in port, the ships were very vulnerable to bombing raids. Brest was well inside the British medium and heavy bomber range, and Bomber Command simply was not going to pass up the chance to bomb two German capital ships. The first attack resulted in four Beauforts attacking the Nisenau. Three of them broke off, but a single plane pressed on. The pilot, Kenneth Campbell, purposefully closed to practically suicidal range before dropping his torpedo, resulting in his plane being shot down seconds after the drop. The resulting torpedo hit the Nisenau, and caused major internal damage. For his sacrifice, Kenneth Campbell was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. The Scharnhorst was spurred any damage from the initial British attacks, but was moved to La Palice to avoid concentrating too many forces in Brest. However, La Palice was once again inside British bomber range, and on the 23rd of July, 15 four-engine heavy bombers appeared overhead. She was hit by five bombs, two punching right through the entire ship and coming to rest on the sea floor. One other bomb penetrated the ship but failed to detonate and the remaining two other bombs hit towards the rear of the ship and detonated upon impact on the armoured deck. The bombing caused two deaths and 15 injuries but more importantly the damage forced the Scharnhorst back to Brest for repairs. 
putting the ship out of service for at least four months. In early 1942, several German warships were now in Brest, and Hitler had started to become paranoid about an Allied invasion of Norway. To counter this, Hitler wanted his remaining heavy naval units to be brought back to Germany. The Germans had two options, sail north, past the Denmark Strait, which was dangerous as it would give the British fleet a lot of time to prepare to counter them. Alternatively, the German ships could sail straight up the English Channel, which would leave them vulnerable to British aircraft, destroyers and fast attack craft. The latter option was chosen, and the German High Command saw it as suicide. Hitler disagreed, and forced the plan to go ahead. With significant air cover from the Luftwaffe, as well as a vast swarm of German E-boats, amazingly, all three heavy units made it back to German ports. But both Scharnhorst and Neisenau hit magnetic mines at different parts of their journey. Scharnhorst was dead in the water for a full 15 minutes, and after she had been attacked in this state, she would have been entirely defenceless. This was a huge missed opportunity for the British, and the fact that all three ships made it up the English Channel was a huge PR disaster for the Royal Navy, as it was the first time in over 200 years a hostile force had dominated the English Channel. Whilst back in port in Germany, the Scharnhorst was then put in dock for repairs until July 1942. Early into the following year, 1943, Scharnhorst was now being deployed to Norway, along with the battleship Tirpitz and the pocket battleship Lutzow. At this point in the war, the German Navy was suffering major fuel shortages, which forced most heavy surface vessels to stay at anchor in various Norwegian ports. This fuel shortage prevented any major voyages, and all Kriegsmarine vessels were confined to short-range cruising missions. This changed in September of 1943, as Scharnhorst, Tirpitz, as well as nine large destroyers embarked on Operation Zitronella. This involved the German task force steaming to Spitsbergen, an island located far north of Norway. This island contained an Allied weather station, which as you may have guessed, produced weather reports for Allied planners, which allowed Allied Arctic convoys to safely avoid most of the bad weather commonly found in the North Sea. Both Tirpitz and Shanhar shot up the island, which basically had no defences, apart from literally two 3-inch guns, and a couple of 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft guns. Neither of the capital ships took damage, but the 40mm guns ambushed some of the destroyers. While the shell fire from the German ships knocked out the main radio transmitter, it was soon fixed, and the subsequent call for raid resulted in the British home fleet being dispatched to Spitsbergen. Although, they arrived too late for a naval engagement, as the Germans had already steamed back to Axis-controlled Norway. Once again, the Allies had missed a huge opportunity to knock out two German capital ships. This failure would partially be made up for, as on the 22nd of September, two British midget submarines would detonate mines on the Tirpitz while she was a tanker. While the monster 45,000 ton Tirpitz didn't sink, repairing her would take many months, leaving the Scharnhorst as the Germans' only available capital ship. By this point in the war, the Eastern Front had completely collapsed for the Germans, and they were in full retreat. The German High Command believed that destroying the British aid convoy to the Soviet Union would cripple the communist war effort, and in December of 1943, the Scharnhorst and her five escorting destroyers would leave port for one final voyage. It's worth noting, at this time of the year in the Arctic Circle, the daylight hours are basically non-existent. Only around one full hour of daylight was available per day, with the rest being near dark twilight. This meant spotting convoys, and more importantly, enemy fleets, was a lot harder. The weather was also terrible. Not only was it near constantly dark, but there were also frequent blizzards and snowstorms. The Arctic convoy designated JW-55B was located several times by the Germans, both from the year as well as from U-boat reports. The Scharnhorst was dispatched with orders to be aggressive, but not to seek engagement with overwhelming British forces. Unknown to the Germans, the British were intercepting all of the Kriegsmarine's orders, and parts of the British home fleet had been put to sea, most notably the 14-inch armed battleship HMS Duke of York, one of the King George V class of battleships which had compared the Scharnhorst to earlier. The British split their forces. One force contained heavy cruiser HMS Norfolk, as well as light cruisers HMS Sheffield and Belfast. This first task group was located south of the convoy, placed in the likely path of approach of the Scharnhorst. They were to intercept the ship and basically act as a screening force. The second British task force included HMS Duke of York, light cruiser HMS Jamaica, as well as several S-class destroyers. The British plan was to sandwich the Scharnhorst between both task forces, effectively blocking the Scharnhorst path to retreat. At this point in the war, the British knew that the German ships were a lot faster. In fact, Due to the adverse weather conditions in the North Sea at this time of the year, 
the Shan Horse was actually faster than the British destroyers, and the larger ships in the British task force could only dream of getting up to the Shan Horse top speed. Due to this, the British wanted to close the range down to the Shan Horse, giving British gunners as long as possible to hit the Shan Horse before the Shan Horse ran out of gun range. The Shan Horse was originally spotted by HMS Belfast using its radar system. She was tracked by radar, and when the range had closed down to 12,000 yards, tracked by eyesight. This short range, 12,000 yards, was near point blank range for World War II, a testament to just how poor their visibility was. The light cruisers Belfast and Sheffield opened fire with their 6 inch guns, but scored no hits. However, Norfolk, the larger heavy cruiser, took considerable more time when aiming its 8 inch guns. As a result, two hits were scored. One did very little damage, but the second knocked out the Shan Horst forward search radar, leaving the ship effectively blind in the forward firing arcs. While the two frontal turrets of the Shan Horst were still very capable and very dangerous, the loss of the radar meant it was practically impossible for them to get an accurate fire solution, as due to weather, the backup optical sights couldn't really be used. Because of this, the Shan Horst chose to run, heading south, right into the other British task force. HMS Belfast once again tracked the ship, which was kindly feeding the location of the German ship to all other British vessels in the area. Because of the Scharnhorst forward search radar having been knocked out by Norfolk, she could not see the British trap she was heading straight into. The Duke of York allowed the range to close, down to 12,000 yards. Again, point blank range for battleship grade weaponry. HMS Belfast then fired a star shell, illuminating the German ship and also ruining the night vision of any German lookout, which, with the poor weather, destroyed fire control radar, and now even the vision of human crew members impaired, the Scharnhorst was finding it very hard to even identify the enemy ships firing at it, never mind return accurate fire. The Duke of York engaged the German ship, with its first accurate salvo impacting the A turret, which jammed it in place. The shell splinters also caused the fire, which resulted in both A and B turrets having their magazines flooded. Another salvo, minutes later, impacted the ship's number one boiler room, slowing the ship down to under 10 knots. Although the two forward turrets were now knocked out, the Scharnhorst was still firing the rear sea turret. One of her 11 inch rounds struck the Duke of York, destroying a cable linking the fire control radar to the gunnery station. Now, just like the Scharnhorst, the Duke of York was now sailing blind in the forward arc. Both ships made temporary repairs. The Scharnhorst got back up to a speed of 22 knots, and the British battleship repaired the radar. This was done by a member of the crew climbing up the main mast in the snowstorm and rewiring the radar system. With the Scharnhorst once again trying to run, the British Admiral on board HMS Duke of York, Admiral Bruce Fraser, ordered the accompanying destroyers to launch a torpedo spread. Eight of these torpedoes were fired at the Scharnhorst, with four hitting the port side of the ship. One of these torpedoes damaged the port propeller shaft, slowing the Scharnhorst down once again to around 10 knots. This is what ultimately doomed the German battleship. With the Scharnhorst unable to run, all of the British ships quickly closed the range, with HMS Jamaica and Belfast moving in for another torpedo attack, and with all other British ships now concentrating their fire, as well as several more torpedoes hitting the ship, the Scharnhorst was turned into a fiery hellscape within minutes. With the ship now resembling the inside of a volcano, hot, full of toxic gases, and incredibly dangerous, the surrounding Arctic water was the complete opposite, but unfortunately for the crew of the German ship, it was equally as deadly. Of the 1,968 officers and enlisted men who left on this voyage, only 36 men were pulled from the North Sea, with none of them being officers. With the loss of the Scharnhorst, the Kriegsmarine's last fully operational capital ship had been sank. While the Tirpitz was technically still commissioned, it was still under repair, and a year later in November of 1944, Tirpitz too was sank. In the end, the Scharnhorst class never got to test their metal against the intended French Navy, but instead, the ship, as well as really all of the German surface fleet, was used in a pointless and costly surface raiding campaign, which neither threatened the British fleet or the British war effort. While the ships did force the British to keep a large fleet at Scapa Flow, denying the Mediterranean theatre of several powerful warships, the Scharnhorst itself was unable to have a meaningful effect on the course of the war. The idea that a small group of German surface vessels could challenge the British Navy was almost as foolish as Hitler thinking he could challenge all of Europe at the same time. A foolish set of thinking which unfortunately led to the deaths of millions of civilians across all theatres of the war, and the scars of that terrible conflict still have geopolitical consequences to this day. The conflict in the Balkans, Crimea and Ukraine all stem from the horrors of that conflict. While this is quite a grim ending to the video, 
I hope you found it engaging and formative, and thank you very much for watching.